Thank you for joining me again on our Genuine Diamonds in Arkansas YouTube channel. I'm your host, Glenn W. Worthington. I'm literally the guy who wrote the book on diamonds in Arkansas. Um, I want to show you some uh, diamonds. I think you'll like to see them from a set of 10 historic uncut diamonds that were mined in Arkansas in 1931 at the site that we now call the Crater of Diamonds State Park. I would like to introduce you to each one of uh, seven different diamonds and study them closely. The ones I'm going to show you are all very unique and special. They're from the Matilda and Carl Pfeiffer Museum. Let me zoom in on that so you can see that picture better. That's a five of the diamonds. But uh, this information I'm going to present to you first appeared in Western and Eastern Treasure Magazine in September of 2009. Uh, if you look here, it says Historic Diamonds Return to Arkansas. This is an article I wrote for the magazine. Uh, and here's a picture. We'll be seeing some of the these pictures uh, in this video, but these in the magazine are all black and white, which is very unfortunate because you need to really see these diamonds in color. So you'll get to see them in color. I took all these photos in the magazine, printed them along with my article. But uh, you'll see these photos up close and we'll study each diamond and kind of go over the information that I wrote here about this. But uh, again, this is from Western and Eastern Treasure Magazine and we'll We'll uh, get started and take a look. So, uh, here's another set. You can see the, the five of them. Uh, here they are on a display. And uh, there, there's, a, there's all ten of the diamonds. We're only going to look at seven of them up close. But this is the... Matilda and Carl Pfeiffer Museum and Study Center in Piggott, Arkansas. It used to be Carl and Matilda's home. Now it is a free mineral museum. Matilda Pfeiffer was a sister-in-law of the famous American author Ernest Hemingway. Uh, this is a photo of Ernest Hemingway and his, his wife Pauline. It was taken in Paris in 1927. Matilda Pfeiffer's relatives lived in the nearby Hemingway Pfeiffer House that is now open to the public as a museum. Now, uh, Ernest Hemingway wrote his book, A Farewell to Arms, in that house. While visiting Piggott, Arkansas, I enjoyed seeing his typewriter and office where he wrote. But while in Piggott, <laughs> The Board of Trustees at the Matilda and Carl Pfeiffer Museum and the employees that work there invited my wife Cindy and I to a dinner in their honor that was held at the museum. Now, while we were there, we also enjoyed seeing all of their minerals that are on display and especially the set of 10 historic uncut diamonds that were mined in Arkansas in 1931 at the site we now call the Crater of Diamond State Park. I would like to tell you the fascinating story of how this set of diamonds were brought back to Arkansas. My wife Cindy and I bought and sold uncut Arkansas diamonds on the Murfreesboro Courthouse Square for 20 years. When the National Geographic magazine came to town to do an article they took a photo of our sign and made it a two-page spread in their March 2002 issue. Uh, we got a call from Wayne Like of Crystallia, a well-known mineral dealer in California. Uh, he was trying to help the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. This is a picture of it. It was founded in 1813 the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia. So, <clears throat> uh, Wayne, like with uh, Cristalli, was uh, trying to help the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia sell 10 diamonds 
from Arkansas that were believed to have been in their museum since 1933. Uh, these 10 diamonds ranged in size from 43 points. Now, that's a little less than half a carat because there's 100 decimal points of weight per carat. So, from 43 points all the way up to 4.95 carats. So, under a half point up to almost 5 carats. The total weight of the collection was 22.91 carats. This is another picture of the museum, a more modern picture of the same place. And then... Uh, here, here's a look at the inside of the museum. So uh, Wayne wanted us to help him determine the value of this collection of 10 diamonds. We urged him not to even consider cutting any of them, but to sell them as natural specimens. We asked him to email him, us some photos because the value depends, we couldn't appraise it just over the phone or knowing the sizes and everything. The value depends a lot upon the shape, purity of each diamond, as much as it does the weight and the color of the diamond. But Wayne apparently got busy preparing to set up for his large display at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show, and he never got around to sending us those photos. At the same time, Cindy and I were negotiating to place an Arkansas diamond into a mineral museum in Pickett, Arkansas. We had been corresponding with Don Reeder, a trustee, He's pictured here, giving a talk, holding up a mineral. Um, we'd been corresponding with Don Reeder, a, a trustee of the Matilda and Carl Pfeiffer Museum. He chose to postpone his decision on the diamond purchase we were offering until he returned from the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. While he was at the show, and see, they, they also had their minerals on display at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show, not to sell them, but just to show them, to show what the museum had. But while he was there, Mr. Reader purchased the set of 10 diamonds for their mineral collection from Wayne. Uh, so he met Wayne and Don, Donna there at the Tucson Gem, Gem and Mineral Show, purchased them, and uh, we were relieved to learn that he had bought them because now they would not be cut, but rather displayed for public viewing in their natural form. And we were pleased that these historic diamonds returned to the state where they had been found. We learned there was a man from Australia watching the transaction uh, between Don and, and uh, Wayne. And uh, he was wanting to take the diamonds back to Australia if the Arkansas Museum had not purchased them when they did. Uh, Mr. Reader graciously drove the 190 miles from Piggott to Little Rock so I could photograph the newly acquired collection. It contains fine examples of uh, all three major colors of diamonds found in Arkansas. Uh, here you can see them that uh, there are white, actually clear diamonds, but they're called white. Uh, so, white, brown, and yellow diamonds. Uh, their collection also includes one atypical green diamond. Uh, since the time that the diamond bearing site became an Arkansas State Park in 1972, 60% of the diamonds found were registered as white or clear, 21% brown, 17% yellow, and only 2% other colors like green, orange, pink, and black. Now let's look at each diamond. Uh, the smallest in this historic collection is a 43-point green diamond. The crystal is complete and intact, and it is not cracked or cleaved. It is well-rounded and lustrous, but the surface is not smooth. However, the rare color of this diamond makes it more valuable to mineral collections to collectors than a white diamond of the same size and quality. The next diamond, whoops, is an 85 point white. Uh, you can see it right here. This is the best, closest photo I have it uh, of it. Uh, and then uh, the last diamond in this collection, under one carat, is an elongated 89 point uh, rich yellow diamond. 
It exhibits high quality and has smooth, clear surface texture over 90% of the crystal. Uh, unfortunately, and this is a closer look at it, the beauty of this diamond is spoiled by feathers or cracks and imperfections along one end. On a positive note, this diamond exi exhibits the unique features of fluorescing under black light. And only about 20% of diamonds worldwide, and true of the diamonds at the crater, only about 20% of them will fluoresce under a black light. It doesn't add anything to the quality, it's just an interesting characteristic. Uh, since we are looking at this collection of diamonds in order of their weight, it is significant to point out that the size of the next diamond is 2.34 carats, which is over two and a half times heavier than the last diamond we just examined. Only one out of every 34 diamonds found in Arkansas weighs over one carat, and this diamond weighs over two carats. Diamonds increase expansion <laughs> expansion <laughs> exponentially in value with each additional carat of weight per crystal. In other words, one two carat diamond is worth more than two one carat diamonds of similar quality. This is true of diamonds found worldwide and is due to the rarity of larger crystals. Now, this unique, lovely shaped, elongated diamond would be registered in the white category, but it actually is, is clear. The somewhat frosty yet lustrous surface gives this diamond a silvery appearance. It is very eye appealing, with the exception of a cavity containing dark material, most likely iron and carbon, right here in this one little spot. So it, it's not a big detraction at all. At first glance, the next largest diamond, this uh, football-shaped 2.45 carat brown diamond, is not very desirable. Thus, most people would not consider it very valuable, except for its unusually large size. However, upon closer examination, this diamond was found to fluoresce under black light, and, more importantly, a dominant feature is in is a red mineral that appears to me to be a garnet, a pyrope garnet inclusion on the side. Now diamonds form or grow one carbon atom by atom at a time over a hundred miles deep within the earth. In the same region known as the diamond stability zone, pyrope garnets also formed. This specimen is not so much a garnet inside of a diamond, but rather a garnet in a diamond matrix. In other words, this seems to be an example of a diamond growing around a pyrope garnet. The garnet here is the host rock. This specimen is of great scientific value to someone studying to write a dissertation about the environment of the diamond stability zone that exists under Arkansas. Fortunately, a professor who is an expert on diamond inclusions tested this diamond, and he discovered it contains one garnet and six olivines. So this one red spot is actually seven, a cluster of seven minerals together, and why they're red I don't know because olivines tend to be green. But anyway, one garnet and six olivines is what that actually is, and I was very pleased to have an expert finally touch it with the probe of a scanning electron microscope and see what this mineral was. So this fascinating study was done, but it was never published because the man who did the research, after sending an email to the museum he had borrowed it from for the study, uh, he passed away and didn't, didn't publish his article of his findings. But uh, the next large diamond in the collection, oh, here's another uh, look at the brown one, and it's a unique football shape, but uh, you can see that inclusion there on the side. Now the next large diamond in the collection is a 3.13 carat white. Uh, you can see it here in the back, and this is the closest picture I've got of it. I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, you can kind of see all of them in the cards while they were on display there. 
Uh, this 3.13 karat white diamond is imperfectly shaped, but it has a good luster and a good size. I mean, wow, over three carats, but it is internally unclean due to an apparent feather that has filled with iron staining. The flaws I have pointed out in the other diamonds help make this next diamond even more special and spectacular. It is a 3.40 carat flawless canary yellow that is my personal favorite piece of eye candy in the entire set of 10 historic diamonds. One look explains why I feel this way. Not only is it huge and lustrous, but this diamond is a complete crystal without any internal or external flaws is flawless. If the color were less intense, it would be less valuable. But the deep, rich canary color qualifies this beauty as a fancy di diamond of great worth because it is so highly desirable. They called it the Matilda Diamond after the benefactor for their museum. Let's go back and get a closer look at that beauty. I just love the natural shape, the contour lines on that, and the lovely natural faces. This has not been cut or polished. None of these diamonds have. This is the way they look when they're found. Another unique quality of this diamond is that it also fluoresces under black light. So they've got three that fluoresce under black light when really only 20% of them do. But uh, the museum, <clears throat> well, the next diamond I want to look at is a 3.85 carat white diamond that is uniquely wedge shaped. It's a gem and it has a large footprint footprint because it is fairly flat over half of its surface. It possesses a high natural luster and an eye appealing shape. It is internally flawless but has two small surface flaws you can barely see. One of the imperfections is that a small amount of the tip has been chipped over here. You can barely see it. Off of one end uh, by the nature of, uh, either nature did this or man's diamond recovery process chipped it. But uh, the other imperfection is a slight natural zipper that is a surface feather. Isn't that interesting there? But it really doesn't attract much from the beauty. These flaws are not noticeable without magnification, so it would be classified as a near flawless clear white diamond of exceptional size. A photo of this diamond appears on the front cover of my book, Genuine Diamonds Found in Arkansas. Uh, see it here? And it even says 3.85 carat found in 1931. And it's also on the front cover of my DVD about how to find diamonds in Arkansas. Uh, but there, there's a look at that 385, just a little bit different look but it is really pretty see you can see the flaws there uh, and nice luster nice shape the flaws are minimal and then here in this picture you can't see it at all and look at the clarity just it, it looks like a chunk of ice there uh, so anyway very very pure pretty lovely diamond uh, The next diamond, uh, uh, the final and largest diamond in the selection is a 4.92 carat pale yellow and is a classic example of diamond structure. Uh, most diamonds form at a depth as octahedrons. See, this is an octahedron. Two four-sided pyramids joined base to base. So uh, that's an octahedron. And as the crystals grow atom by atom, natural trigons or triangular indentions form on the surface. During, during the ascent to the surface, the rate of cooling affects the amount of resorption or melting away of the outer portion of the diamond. This next spe specimen, let me go ahead and flip to it and you can see what I'm talking about. See, it has trigons in the surface and it does look pretty close to an octahedron. It hadn't resorbed as much as that big yellow one with the natural curves in it. 
So because it, it kind of, if you think of it like an ice cube melting, this ice cube that was an octahedron ice cube hasn't melted or resorbed as much as like that, that big, beautiful yellow. Ah, here we go. Looking at that. See, that has resorbed a lot. A lot of the, that started out as an octahedron, but a lot, if it was like an ice cube, it melted more than than this 4.95 or almost 5 carat white that we're looking at right now. So, uh, anyway, this is the diamond we're talking about. But I want to talk about the process of resorption some. So they, they start out in this form, and then depending on how much it melts. Now, that 4.92 kind of looks like this. But then that other one, the 340 yellow, looks more like this. A tetrahexahedron. <laughs> That's a mouthful. I got through it, though. <laughs> but um, also looking at it this way, if, if the diamond didn't start out as an octahedron, if it started out like this or like a cube, they can still melt down and, or resorb down and you have these different transitions and you can still end up with the, the same results. So I'm not saying that the 3.40 yellow started out as an octahedron, definitely, because <laughs> we don't know. But it could have started out like this or like this cube, but the end result is very much like that in that 3.40 yellow. But the white one we're talking about now, the 4.95, is like this. It is a barely resolved, uh, barely resorbed octahedron. See it there? So uh, let's go on and, and just look at the stone itself while I talk about it a little. Um, <clears throat> This uh, really makes a fascinating scientific piece, although a little more resorption would have left it more eye-pleasing, uh, it would have reduced its weight. This 4.95 carat diamond seems extremely clear, clear and clean internally and only has a small amount of iron or carbon staining in the pits of the surface. So, oh, this one also fluoresces under black light, but it is a pale yellow, so a little bit off white. Um, if it were either clear white or deep fancy canary yellow, it would be more valuable. However, it is still a diamond of great worth, partly because it weighs nearly five carats, and diamonds increase expansion, expense, <laughs> there's that word again, uh, ex exponentially in price per point with each additional carat per weight, as we saw earlier. Now, for a little of the history behind this set of 10 historic diamonds. Shortly after John Huddleston, shown here at the left, found his, the first two diamonds on his hog farm in rural Arkansas, two miles from Murfreesboro, three Little Rock businessmen quickly formed a company and bought Mr. Mr. Huddleston's farm for $36,000, which was a virtual fortune in our nation in 1906 economy. This is one, Sam Rayburn, one of the bankers, one of the three businessmen that bought Huddleston's farm for $36,000. So the uh, photo looks old, but it's more than 100 years old. So I guess, uh, guess there's a reason for that. Um, the three Little Rock businessmen approached diamond mining cautiously. Small haphazard attempts were made at diamond recovery and some diamonds were found in the following years. It took them 12 years, but by 1919 they finally got serious about mining diamonds on Huddleston's old farm. The company reorganized and became the Arkansas Diamond Corporation. Then they constructed a washing plant on a concrete foundation at the south end of their minefield. In April of 19, in the April 20th, 1920 edition of Engineering and Mining Journal, Sam Rayburn, the man in that picture, reported that during the first four months, 1,400 fairly large diamonds were recovered. So that was in 1920. Between October 1919 and the end of 1922, four long Deep trenches were cut across the diamond-bearing soil that made a wagon wheel spoke-like pattern. 
for some unknown reason, the Arkansas Diamond Corporation discontinued the excavation of their spoke-like trenches in 1923. Um, that This is the frame for the winch that pulled, that dragged the ore to the bottom of this long conveyor and the conveyor fed it up into the plant and then it was gravity fed, you know, with water pumping into it and everything. It washed through the various stages of diamond recovery all the way down to the bottom and then the tailings were discharged out of the back of the building. <clears throat> uh, so they abandoned the spoke-like trenches in 1923, but they continued processing. They continued processing ore through the plant. And the, the following is their reported annual diamond recovery. So 1906 to 22, before the plant, about 2,000 carats. Then in 23, 1,300. In 24, almost 1,300 carats again. Then in 1925, half that much. So we don't know for certain why there are no statistics for 1926 through 1929, but I would speculate that there was nothing to report because mining was suspended due to the fact that 1925's production figures were less than half that of the previous year's carrot recovery. It appears that the corporation did attempt diamond recovery again in 1930 and 1931. Then with the onset of the Great Depression, mining was suspended indefinitely because the value of diamonds dropped dramatically along with the demand. But <clears throat> the ten diamonds were part of these diamonds and they were found in 1931 and then uh, went to the museum in Philadelphia in 1933. So that's our look at the historic diamonds that uh, returned to Arkansas. I'm glad they're at the museum. If you ever get up in the northeast corner of the state, it's about 275 miles, about the farthest point from the Crater of Diamonds that you can get in Arkansas. Um, but uh, we made the trip and enjoyed it and uh, uh, they, they've got a nice set of diamonds there as well as other minerals. And um, So if you get up to Pigot, take a look at that and the Hemingway Museum as well when you're there. But uh, uh, thanks for joining me and please subscribe to our Genuine Diamonds in Arkansas YouTube channel because I'm going to keep uh, posting new videos all the time. Thanks a lot.